I'm Aaron Spatz, and this is the Veterans Business Podcast, a podcast centered around the stories of U.S. military veterans and their adventures in the business world following their time in service. It's stories of challenges and obstacles, and an inside look at how veterans find their life's work, their purpose, and their post-military lives. This week, we speak with Marine veteran and keynote speaker, Sean Rhodes. Sean spent a few years in the Marine Corps as a combat correspondent before jumping out and ultimately making his way into the business of public speaking. Sean shares with us some incredible perspective. We talk about mental health and dive into a veteran's perspective. When we get out, we have a mindset and a set of life experiences that give us a different perspective of the world than even the college professors that are, you know, twice or three times our age. We talk about one of his favorite quotes. We can't control always the things that happen to us, but we have complete control over how we react to them. And we also talk about being a solution to a problem. Be the, be the solution, but don't be the solution for you before you figure out what the challenge is that you're there to solve. I also share with you some very exciting news at the end of the podcast. Let's get to it. Sean, thanks so much for taking time out of your day. And uh, we're excited to have you here on the show. And so if, if you wouldn't mind, just quickly share with us some of your background, your backstory, what, what made you crazy enough to go join the United States military and give us a little bit of uh, context as to what you did. Absolutely, sir. So uh, again, my name is Sean Rhodes. I was in the U.S. Marine Corps from 2001 to 2005. Um, I had joined uh, prior to 9-11, so I thought I was going to have a nice, easy tour. But like a lot of service members, we discovered that we were going to be uh, serving during a wartime period in our nation's history. So I was able to do two deployments to Iraq with the Marine Corps, and I had kind of a unique job with them, which we'll get into in the course of this interview, I'm sure. And then uh, after I got out of the Marine Corps, Face the same hurdles and struggles and transition that all veterans uh, seem to face from the ones I've spoken with anyway, kind of reintegrating back into a society and not really having a clear idea about what our place or purpose might be. And so I can share with you a little bit of the uh, the things that you know I went through and hopefully some of the resources that have helped me out as well. Uh, but it's been a heck of a journey. Um, and I just realized recently that it's been about 20 years uh, wow. since I first joined up. And it's amazing how fast time passes. I know some veterans listening to this will say, Dude, you, you're a, you're a young kid, only 20 years. Come on, but yeah, it's been 20 years for me, so that's pretty impressive. I've lived this long. <laughs> wow, no, that's that's, uh, that's fantastic, and it is it is crazy how quickly time time passes. And next thing you know, you look up, and wow, you know, it's been it's been quite some time. So that that's uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's crazy. Yeah, share with us a little bit about um, a little bit more of the specifics as to what you did and 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 some of the things that you that you're able to do. Absolutely. So uh, when I joined, um, I took the ASVAB like most of us did in, in high school. And the recruiter took one look at that and said, you are pretty much unqualified for just about every job that we have. And this was a Marine Corps recruiter at the time. Um, why I chose the Marine Corps, I'll get into in just a second. But he said, uh, you know, listen, of all the stuff we have, you you have a predilection to defy authority, which is really not going to do well if you decide to be in the infantry or any job really in the Marine Corps whatsoever. Uh, you have no math skills. You can't engineer yourself out of a wet paper bag. Uh, the one thing that you're rated highly on is verbal comprehension. I was off the charts in that area because I love to read and you know, I was in you know debate club and the high school newspaper and all that stuff. They said, if you're really set on joining the military and you really think the Marine Corps is the way to go, Marine Corps recruiters have a good way of trying to disqualify candidates just to make us want it more. Uh, <laughs> but he said, if you're really interested in it, there's one job that you might be a good fit for, and I've never actually enlisted anyone into that military occupational specialty, that MOS. So he had to get you know, clearance from the regional office. And the job I went into was to be a combat correspondent. Uh, what you might think of as like Joker and Full Metal Jacket, the old yeah. Stanley Kubrick movie. Absolutely. So rolling around with a camera and a notepad and embedding in different units and basically hopping around uh, the battle space, reporting on what these men and women across all branches of the service were doing. And so that was the job that I ended up uh, getting into. Now, why I joined the Marine Corps, I had a fascination my whole life with the martial arts and warrior culture and learning about Spartans and Thermopylae and all that. And when I looked at all of the military branches that were out there, they were each promising a different set of benefits. Uh, It was maybe travel for the Navy. Maybe it was a good lifestyle and educational benefits for the Air Force. Uh, The Army, you know, I'm not quite sure what the Army promised. I don't really remember. I never investigated long enough. Uh, but the Marine Corps was really more about service. It was about 
not what I could get out of it, but what I could give. And at that period of my life, being just 17, that was really appealing to me because I had never been called into anything higher than my own self-interest. And suddenly I had an opportunity to do that for a couple of years, um, get life experience that I wouldn't have gotten anywhere else and get to see a little bit of the world outside my, my hometown in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And so when I finally ended up in the Marine Corps, it was not a match made in heaven. And I still defy authority even to this day. And it's done quite well for me in my business because I, I'm an entrepreneur. I run my own business. Uh, but for the Marines, it taught me a lot of life skills that really served me well in my civilian life. And when I began to realize that I had these skills, because no one says well, you're leaving the military with X, Y, Z skills. They just expect you to either have it or, you know, here, get out. Here's a quick, you know, uh, kick in the butt and, you know, be on your way. But we actually leave with a lot of valuable skills that help us in the civilian workforce. When I began to realize and realize and leverage those, um, I began to understand I had really done myself well by my time in the military, even though not every memory is one that I want to dwell on. <laughs> there are plenty of things they taught me that have really helped me be successful. Yeah, no doubt. And um, and I, I can't help but imagine your tendency to defy uh, the chain of command, I guess, in the in the in the role that you held actually probably served you quite well because you were probably able to go places that other people probably wouldn't have been able to, uh, if they get told, no, they just walk away and say, okay, but right. I'm sure there was plenty of instances where that tenacity, uh, and, and just that part of your personality really came through. And for whatever reason, it really helped open some doors for you, uh, as you traveled the world. It did. Yeah. And my, like you mentioned, my job was kind of unique in that I wasn't uh, put inside of one unit and told, you know, these are the, the 30 men and women that you're going to be around every day for six to eight months or longer if you're stateside and you're just stationed somewhere. I was kind of a lone operator, um, the, the most, you know, unsexy, nerdish kind of lone operator. You think <laughs> operator, you know, the guys with the beards and all the tactical gear and stuff like that wasn't right. me. I was the opposite of that. Uh, but I, I did have the freedom and the order from my chain of command to not stay in any one place too long mm. because they, they, you know, there, were, there weren't very many of me with that job field out there and they, they needed a lot of coverage. And so for much of my time deployed, I was given free reign to travel in between units. And I would, wow. you know, I had to learn how to check in somewhere quickly, ingratiate myself to the people who could get me where I needed to go, which was out on a convoy or on a patrol or whatever, and then uh, get pushed out into the field. And the challenge, of course, then is how do I get back to the rear? Because these <laughs> these cats, these men and women are out there for you know months at a time without showers or good shower or any of that. And I I'm running out of battery in my camera. You know, I'm running out of space right. on the on the SD card to store all this stuff on. My laptop's about to die. That's how I do my job. So yes, I'm a rifleman first, but if I stop sending copy back to my home office, they're going to start getting angry. So right. I had to figure out. How do I convince them to let me on the patrol when all the Marines would prefer to be on the patrol to go back home to the forward operating base to get a hot shower? Right. So it was it was always a learning experience to figure out how do I um, how do I learn what I need to know in order to convince these folks that I'm a value enough to take up a seat in their vehicle mm. with not only the fact that, you know, I, I could shoot if I had to, but also that I have a job that's not going to get done except with my skill set, which is to share with the world sacrifices that you all are making out here in the field. Wow. No, I mean, I, that's an incredible perspective. And uh, it, shoot, it would have been, it would, I'm sure it would have been uh, entertaining just to have a, another correspondent follow you and just document your journey. Because uh, I, I, I can't imagine some of the things that you saw, some of the conversations that you had either, you know, with, with guys serving there you know, at the very front or people in support or, you know, if, if you interact with any of the locals. Um, I, I, I can't imagine the things that you saw. It was, it was very interesting. I often refer to myself as a battlefield tourist uh, and that I was, I was just visiting these places a lot of times. Uh, yeah. I, I would spend six or eight months, you know, on, on a forward deployed, um, you know, kind of a situation where I was outside the wire, but I didn't have to man a checkpoint on, uh, you know, a main supply route for, you know, 74 hours waiting for the attacks to come either. That didn't happen to me very often, but it happened to so many men and women that I reported on that I served with. Wow. And so it was, uh, you know, my, my calling, my role, if you will, was to get in there and discover the sacrifices that these men and women were making with their time and often their health and their safety in order to serve a higher purpose. And for that reason, I feel like, you know, I'll never measure up to them. I have no desire to. They sacrificed way more than I ever will. Uh, but if somebody wasn't there to tell the story, then nobody would know. And so while I 
can't hold myself on the same playing field as a lot of those men and women. Um, I, you know, I'm very proud of the service that I was able to give, just like any service member should, whether you were changing tires back in, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the motor T uh, shed or whether you were out there on, on the forward line with a sniper rifle, right. everybody has a part to play in making that mission happen. Absolutely. And, and that story needs to be told. And so, I mean, uh, the role in the shoes that you filled, I mean, no doubt, incredibly, a uh, very critical role in terms of it, people, people want to know, people want to know what's going on. And I think, uh, and I, I think we owe it to them to tell that story. So no, that's a, that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic experience. So tell us about how the transition process for you worked out. Like, you know, when, when did you realize you were, you know, you were going to decide to leave and then what did it look like for you when you punched out? Well, because I, I went in the Marine Corps knowing what I wanted to get out of it, which is a pretty rare thing from when I talk to other service members, because most of us join at 17 or 18 or, you know, maybe we're still in our, our late teens and we're trying to figure ourselves out and, and life in general. And this seems like a good way to get some kind of compass or some kind of directional you know, setting on that. Uh, when I went into the Marine Corps, I knew that I probably wasn't going to spend a lifetime in there. But I knew that I also was lacking some things that I wanted in order to be successful in life, to have confidence, to, to know that whatever challenge I was presented with, I would either succeed at overcoming it or die trying. Uh, so those are kind of the, the mindset and the skills that I wanted. And I didn't have at 17. And so because I knew what I wanted going in, um, I realized probably after my first tour in Iraq that this wasn't going to be a permanent gig for me. Uh, because that might, it's just like a lot of people kind of know when they're going to, if they reenlist, will it be stationed next? Well, for me, this was 2004, and they told me, if you re-enlist, we're going to attach you with a reconnaissance unit that's shipping off to Afghanistan. And I thought to myself, you know, I think I've been shot at enough for one lifetime. <laughs> and there are some folks that love it. They get a charge out of it. For me, no, we're good. A couple of times, I got what I needed out of that experience. Thank right. you very much. So I was actually the story that the transition planners uh, talk about. Uh, and they probably still share the story because, because you know, I, like I said, I knew I was going to get out. And this was maybe three years into my four-year enlistment. And so I was in Iraq second time around at a forward operating base south of Baghdad. And I was putting in my college applications from the field. So whenever I had a free moment to get into like the, you know, the MWR shed where we actually had internet access, I was filling out college applications. Wow. And I would stay up until 3 a.m., get on the, uh, the field phone, dial back to the admissions office at these universities I was applying to and, you know, make sure that they had all they needed because it would take you know, eight weeks to get mail back and forth to us out there. So right. it was much easier for me just to wait for the phone. And, you know, they'd always say, you know, connection's really bad. You know, are, are, are you, are you muffling your voice? I said, no, I'm south of Baghdad right now. Come on, man, help me out. <laughs> you know, get, get this application through so I can, you know, uh, attend your college. And so by the time I got out of the Marine Corps, I knew what classes I would be taking, when school was going to start, all that stuff was already mapped out for me because I knew university was the next thing on my, uh, my kind of life path. And so three or four months after I got out of the Marine Corps, I was in university, 22 years old, had seen half the world, multiple combat tours. And my roommate, my college roommate, turned 18 a few days before school started. Oh, man. And so I was like a lot of veterans that decided to go to university after school. I was surrounded by kids. You know, there's really no other way to say it because uh, they still had that mindset about them. Uh, and I was, you know, far and beyond that at that point. I mean, oh, I knew man. how to take care of myself, you know. Uh, pay my bills, run my own finances, take care of my car, all the stuff that I'm kind of surrounded by people that are still in high school. And so it was always a very surreal experience for me and all the veterans that were attending uh, you know, school right after the military you kind of dropped in this environment where it's like, oh, dear Lord, what did I do to myself? <laughs> Man, and I, I can imagine just what the stark contrast between, you know, 18-year-old guy going to college and then you just just a few years later. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just we're talking a matter of three to four years and just look at how much life you lived in that time and, you know, and how that experience contrasts. Because I'm sure they looked at you like, holy cow, what is this guy doing? Like, he's got his crap together. Well, that uh, and there's there's often something that's very um, alienating about that. And this is something that a lot of veterans face when they enter the civilian workforce or the university setting after they get out of the military is that there feels like such a separation between them and the people that are around them. Because like you said, we pack a lot of life experience into a couple of years when we're in the military. When we get out, we have a mindset and a set of life experiences that give us a different perspective of the world than even the college professors that are you know, twice or three times our age. 
uh, we've, we've seen more of the world. We've seen the good and the bad of the world a lot more than most humans ever get the chance to. And so being able to connect with folks and make friends and have a social circle that's not just a bunch of salty old veterans like yourself, that's a big challenge for a lot of us, whether we're in the university setting or in the work setting. And so for me, it was my, you know, I had to really lean into finding ways to connect with the people around me because I didn't want to go through a, a couple of years of college, you know, just being a loner. Um, you know, that's how really bad things happen with mental health. Uh, so I wanted to connect with these folks. So I had to look for ways that we did have things in common. Maybe we had a completely different set of life experiences, but I love to play the guitar. So I found people that love to play the guitar and love music, people that love the outdoors. I loved hiking. So I'd go find the people that were go doing that and, you know, connect with them on that level. So it's really about, you know, taking the effort to make the step. Um, I never really, well, I tried this and I failed. I, you know, the first couple of days, it's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm freaking awesome. You know, Sergeant U.S. Marine Corps, you, you people should uh, really respect me. And they don't because they don't know you. And it comes off as arrogance when you're, you, you, you know, sound and, and look and talk like you've got more life experience than everybody else, even if that's the case. Right. And so it was really a, a, an ego drop for me. I had to kind of, you know, let it all go there and say, all right, yes, I do have these life experiences, but I also have to live the rest of my life with people that don't have wartime experience, that don't have military connections. So how do I find ways to connect with these men and women so that we can live together in a community and I can get what I need and what they need out of me? And we can all kind of, uh, you know, be together in, in a way that doesn't make me feel like I can't uh, be connected to humans again unless they have that wartime experience. Yeah, that's such a great mindset. And and I unfortunately, I feel like it's kind of rare. Um, I mean, there's a lot of guys that transition and they and they do they do a good job with the transition. Don't, don't get me wrong, but your mindset and approach to it very rare. And I, and I, it probably has a lot to do with your upbringing in the way that, you know, I mean, we're talking like the years leading up into your decision to, to enter the military. There's this, there's this element about you that's very highly resilient and very highly adaptive. And so you're able to really bounce back and push through. But beyond that, you're able to really look at it from a whole different perspective or you're, you're able to see the bigger picture. And I think that I mean, that has obviously served you very well, and so that that's just an observation. Just as I'm hearing you talk, yeah. And, and there was there was something that really led into that, and it was uh, uh, this is one of those resources I mentioned that I'll pass on to your listeners. It's easily available in any public library. A uh, quick story around it: when I was at one of these forward operating bases, I dropped in after a really nasty mission. Uh, you know, we were just getting torn up, and I had maybe you know 12, 14 hours to uh, write my copy, get some sleep take a shower, and then I was going to be back out on another patrol. So it was one of the more trying times of that deployment. Yeah. And when I got back to this board operating base, there were pallets of books that had all been shipped up and crated over from the U.S. that were just sitting out there in the open. And this is something you don't see a lot in Iraq, especially at a military base. You know, we, we do love to read, but our, our base libraries are like one shelf, you know, <laughs> and then they're all, uh, you know, they're, they're all, you know, like action novels. So this right. is books of a wide variety and sort. And so I went and found the supply officer and I said, sir, what's, what's the story with these books? Thinking that, you know, that a story that I could write where I didn't have to get outside the wire and, you know, put my life on the line <laughs> yet again, like all the other men and women, if I could get another hour to write these stories, that'd be good for me. So, uh, he said, well, the, the libraries in the U.S. had this initiative. They heard that people in Iraq didn't have books except for, you know, really conservative religious material. And so the libraries, you know, kind of donated all the books that they wanted to give away and they've shipped them over here. Now we have to disseminate them into the community. There were a couple of problems with this plan, I immediately realized. In, in a really conservative religious culture, you don't want to pass out books that have like shirtless guys on the cover, you know, like really juicy romance novels. That's a bad idea. Um, they were working that out on their own, but I went looking through these books and I found one that I'd heard about before, never read. Uh, and it was the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey. And it was a random book in the middle of all these, you know, like paper romance wow. novels. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I picked the book up and it was the very first habit that really struck me. And it was, you know, right what I needed to hear at that point in my life. And it was that we can't control always the things that happen to us, but we have complete control over how we react to them or how wow. we perceive them. And at that point in that combat tour, that's exactly what I needed to hear because I wasn't going to, you know, unless I got injured, I wasn't going to give up my position. I wasn't going to get sent home early. So I had to deal with what was being presented to me. It was a crappy situation. There was no way around it. Right. But how I perceived it, how I chose to deal with it was completely in my control. And I could choose to make that an experience that was going to help me or one that was going to harm me. 
And that helped me a lot the rest of that tour. And then in the life that I've led since the military, starting businesses and and running things and doing what I do now, um, that's still something that has stuck with me. One of those life skills that I think all veterans leave with because we're presented with really crappy situations that most civilians would buckle under. Um, and because we have, you know, that calling, we've made that commitment, we have that that service within us that we want to give back, we we pursue it, we we push through. So I may sound resilient. I don't think I'm any more resilient than any of the men or women that are out there that have raised their right hand in the past or will in the future. Uh, and, and a lesson that we all get is how to perceive situations, how to push through, how to be resilient. And that's something that can really serve us well, uh, <laughs> assuming that we balance that with a little bit of self-care and mental health <laughs> along sure. the way. Yeah. Being resilient full time is, is a quick way to burn out. Uh, but if we can find the balance in there and really connect ourselves to why we're doing what we're doing, we have all the ingredients necessary to be very successful post-military. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of these businesses that you started and some of the challenges and lessons that you learned if facing those. So you, you transitioned out, you went to school. So mm-hmm. walk us through what's after that. Yeah, and I- Sure, sure. So uh, the school was very easy for me after the Marine Corps, because all I had to do was show up on time and turn in work. And the work didn't even have to be excellent. Like like just meeting the bar was fine for these professors. And the fact I would argue with them in class showed them that I was engaged. So that was great. I, this is an easy gig. <laughs> so in, in three and a half years, I left with two degrees. Wow. And I thought because of my time in the military, I was going to go after a secure position. The military is pretty secure, assuming you don't get uh, you know, drummed out for health or you don't get downsized. You, you could make a career out of it very easily. And so I thought, well, being a high school teacher would be a pretty good gig because a lot of them were impactful for me. And so that's what I got my degrees in, to be a high school history teacher. Mm. Realized in my first semester of doing that, that uh, it, as, as far as teaching goes, that they wanted about 80 hours of work out of me for $35,000 a year. And this was about 20 years ago. That's what teachers were getting paid. And that wasn't going to work for my lifestyle plans. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I like nicer things than a $35,000 salary can provide. Yeah. And so I bounced over to the uh, National Park Service uh, because being a veteran, you get veterans preference, something a lot of veterans don't know or take advantage of. If you decide you want to work for the government or you want to work for a lot of state agencies, they'll give you preference as a veteran over other candidates that may be more qualified than you with experience because they recognize the value that veterans bring to the workforce. Uh, so I was able to do that, work for the National Park Service, and then um, moved over into the Department of Defense. And I was working for an Air Force unit. Talk about you know seeing things from the other side of the fence, from the Marine Corps to the Air Force. Uh, they got to stay in the nicest hotels. They were always flying to Hawaii. It was a really great lifestyle. Uh, but I realized very quickly that I wasn't going to be able to make the type of life that I wanted for myself working in a bureaucracy. And they're, they're, you know, bureaucracies have their purpose. I'm not downing them. Sure. Uh, I just wasn't going to be a good fit in there because, again, my predilection to defy authority really wasn't going to do me well. <laughs> and so this is about 2013. Um, I asked myself because I didn't have any kids. I was newly married, you know, but didn't have a lot of responsibilities outside of that. I asked myself if I'm going to try something in my life that has the, uh, you know, the large possibility that it might fail, um, but it also might succeed. This is the point in my life to do that. Because my decisions weren't going to affect anybody's quality of life. Uh, my wife was supporting herself. I was supporting myself. You know, we were mm-hmm. just living a, you know, happy, uh, you know, newly married couple life with not a lot of burden. Right. So at that point, I turned in my resignation letter, uh, gave up a permanent party status position with the U.S. government. I was a, a GS rated civilian employee, could have stayed there for another 30 years and started my own business um, to do that. And this is kind of the journey that I went through very briefly. I asked myself, what are the things that people say I do naturally well that I find just extremely easy? You know, I, I could do them all day, no worries. But people look at it and say, dang, that's, that's your unique gift. That's the thing you do that everybody else struggles with, but that you find easy. And for me, that was communicating. For me, that was looking at systems and figuring out ways through and around them, because that's a job the Marine Corps taught me how to do. Uh, you know, to, to ingratiate myself into a, a system or a unit, get what I needed out of it, provide value, and then move on to the next unit. Right. And so that's what I began looking at doing. Now, when I opened my business, I didn't know the difference between an, an LLC or an S-Corp or how to find customers or what numbers I needed to be tracking in my sales. None of that. It was all new to me. And I had liquidated my 401k and my thrift savings plan to provide a little bit of cushion so I could pay the bills while I was learning these things and ramping it up. But it was a crash course in reading books, 
attending events, networking, uh, trying to throw a lot of stuff, throwing a lot of stuff at the wallet and, and, and seeing what stuck and what didn't. Right. And so eventually, this is probably two or three years in, I was at the end of my rope financially. I was running out of money, hadn't produced enough sales to stay in business. And so I asked myself if I was going to consult my company. So what I was trying to do was provide value to other companies to be a speaker, an author, a coach, a consultant. And I wasn't getting a lot of business that way. I was, again, throwing stuff at the wall to see what worked and not getting a lot of stuff that stuck on the wall. And I asked myself, well, given the fact I'm at, you know, the last <laughs> the last couple of dollars I have here to try this before I have to go back to work for the government or somewhere else. If I was going to consult myself and say, Sean, here's what I advise you do, what would that piece of advice be? And for me, it was, you're trying a lot of different things. Why don't you do something consistently, sustain that for as long as you can. And if it doesn't work, then you'll know that at least that failed to not do that anymore. Because what a lot of entrepreneurs do is we try everything and then we wonder why we don't get but very minimal results. Right. And so I began to do this, you know, a couple of things very consistently to generate business. And it began to generate business. Learning what the Marine Corps had taught me, I looked at the overarching system and thought to myself, well, what's not working as well as it could? How do I improve that? Or how do I scrap it all together? For the things that are working, how do I do those five times more or 10 times more in order to get more results? And so I began to kind of play with it. If you think of the, the structure of an engine, um, I was learning how to put better fuel into the engine, learning how to engage all eight cylinders instead of just one or two. And when the engine began to really run uh, with good fuel and on all eight cylinders, that's when the revenue really began to came, uh, you come in. And that's when I could also hire more people to take those tasks off of my hands that I wasn't really excited about doing anymore, that I could systemize so that I was only focusing on the things I was uniquely qualified to do in my business. Wow. Phenomenal story in terms of just having to really ramp it up, having to learn and just, I mean, probably the most, the most uh, pivotal moment for you there was really having to do your own self-assessment and treat yourself as if you're a client and figure out, okay, like what, what should I be doing? Or, you know, what, what advice would I give mm -hmm. myself? So I very, uh, very impactful. What, uh, what kind of business was it that you were starting? Yes. I was looking at the the, uh, again, you know, when I ask myself, what is my unique set of gifts that everybody says you do really easily, that comes more difficult to most people. Um, most folks in the world are terrified of standing on a stage and addressing a group of adults, whether it's a group of five or a group of 5,000. For me, I really got a charge out of doing that. It really excites me even to this day. So public speaking. And then I asked myself, okay, well, if that's what I really do well that most people struggle with, the thing that I find easy that most people don't, who are those people that are getting paid the most to do that? Who are the people making the biggest impact? And names started to come up like Tony Robbins and Les Brown and uh, Marie Forleo and you know people that are out there in the world of social media that are really uh, big influencers. And so from the Marine Corps, you know, if, if I was going to model what a successful mission was, I would look at what had been successfully done in the past. They took a similar hill in Vietnam. They had these challenges. They did this and it worked. So let's model that. Let's figure out what can we pull from that to this hill we're about to take in the Korangal Valley of Afghanistan. And that's a very military kind of thing to do to pull lessons learned in. And so I asked myself, well, if those people out there have marketing assets in play, what are those marketing assets? How are they going to market? How are they selling themselves? You know, what logos do they have on their websites? What do their websites look like? What's their social media following look like? How often are they posting? Uh, who are they connecting with? Who are they bringing on their shows? Do they have podcasts? Do they have video blogs? Are they writing a column? You know, I began to look at what are the things that these people that I want to emulate have in play? And how do I begin to put those pieces on the board? I may not be able to get where they are because they're 30 or 40 years into it, and, you know, overnight. But I can begin to place those things now so that I can at least get my start. I can get my flywheel going. So hopefully it has enough momentum at some point where I don't have to really crank it hard to keep it in motion. And when I began doing those things, suddenly, you know, the assets were in play. The When people look to buy what I have to offer, they can go to my website. They can see that I'm a professional speaker. I've been on large stages. I've got a lot of name brand corporate clients behind me now. So I was just modeling success and figuring out, okay, where are the open spaces that I need to fill? What are the steps I can take today to begin to get those pieces into play? So that one day, maybe I'll have, you know, the, uh, the assets that will get me the type of impact that Tony Robbins might have. 
That's great perspective. And, and like, no doubt that's a, it, it'll be a lifelong pursuit, but at least now, you know, you, you see kind of how, how it's modeled for you and, and you know, you're able to kind of derive things and, and apply it and, and really apply it to your own situation. What, what have been some of the challenges, like as you've, as you've gone down this road in, in, in business from a business perspective, what are, what are some, what are some things that you've had to overcome or, or maybe some things that you weren't, that you didn't think you'd have to face, but yet you, you find them, you find yourself facing some of these, some of these challenges. Yeah. Um, one thing that uh, was a big learning experience for me that will apply to any veteran, whether they're trying to start their own business, they're running their own business, or they're just trying to enter the workforce is that nobody cares about your military service. Uh, people will give a lot of lip service to it. You know, thank you for your service is something that we all hear a lot when we mention that we're in the military, but nobody really cares. It's not the magic key to the kingdom. You mentioned that you were in the military. Job offers don't just start, you know, dropping into your mailbox. <laughs> and so what I had to realize, whether I was trying to be hired by a company, by the government, or by a client, you know, the, now that people hire me on an individual basis, I had to discover what is it that you are trying to achieve? Whether you're a large company, what is the company focused on this quarter or this year? What, what you know, in your last annual report, what did you say the new market was you wanted to open up, expand into, or start chasing? If you're the government, you know, what are you trying to accomplish at this governmental office, whether you're the Department of the Interior, Department of Defense, whatever, and how does that apply to you uniquely in your geography? If it's a client, I always take the time to ask with their event, why are you having your event? What are the challenges that you're going to be addressing that you need experts on your stage to help your audience get through? And once I learned those things, now I can match my skill set, the value proposition that I have, the unique set of experiences that I picked up in the military and since afterwards. Now I can match those as solutions, but I can't do that by stepping in and saying, Hey, I'm an expert in communication. You know, do you need some of that? Well, not really. We're all set there. Thanks. But if I take the time to learn, what are you challenged with right now? If it's a company, well, you know, Sean, we're really challenged with expanding into a new product line. We just released last quarter. It's not getting us the results we need right now. We're just not able to uh, get that clearly across to the people that we know need it. But sounds like what your challenge is, is communication funny that we're talking right now because I happen to be an expert trained by the Department of Defense and how to communicate ideas to a large population. And so now all of a sudden, what they didn't think was going to be a need at all is actually the solution to the problem that is top of mind for them. And that's how I'm able to work across industries to match myself as a solution to a lot of different problems and challenges. And I believe every veteran has this ability as well, because we're all taught to do things on the fly. We're taught to innovate solutions. We're taught to uh, you know, go into a situation where we don't know what's going on, assess what the problem is, fix it as quickly as possible so that the mission can continue. It's just what we're taught to do. That's an extremely useful skill set in the civilian workforce, whether you're running your own business or working for somebody else. If you take the time to figure out what is it are you trying to achieve here, rather than here's what I have, do you need some of that? So that's a completely different way to go to market that's really helped me out. And it, and really, I feel like that is like the one pivotal thing that organizations really grasp onto when they really grow and something that I've seen and without giving myself a commercial here, but you know, one of the things that we've talked about was like, it's important to solve the problem of the customer. Like we, we want to talk a lot about how great we are and we go through our whole resume and our work experience and things that in case studies of why we've been so successful and what we've done. And that's great. And your cust your, your clients, your customers may, may want to see proof of that. Um, the, the ones that are doing their due diligence will absolutely want to see some kind of track record, but they're most interested in how can you solve my problem? Like I, I have, mm -hmm. I have a real issue right now. I need help. I don't even know really how to articulate it. I just know that I don't have X or we're not meeting mm -hmm. these certain KPIs or whatever, like whatever the case may be. And I, and I, you, you hit it right on the head as veterans, we have that ability, but I think what happens is we, if, if you're joining an, an organization, a lot of times it becomes about, Hey, you, you need to learn our product. You need to learn our services. You need to learn like how we're better than everybody else and so on. And so then when we, we get in front of people, we, you know, we have a tendency to talk more about us and not make the conversation or the solution geared specifically towards the customer. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. Well, it's, it's all about them. Uh, there's a, a great old motivational uh, speaker line that everybody's favorite radio station is WIIFM. <laughs> and that's the radio station of what's in it for me. 
when we approach the world of sales from that aspect, doors open up that we didn't even know existed. And whether you're selling a physical product or service or whether you're selling yourself on a resume into an organization, you're in sales and you'll be in sales the rest of your life if you want to have any upward mobility. You'll constantly be selling something, whether it's an idea or yourself as the product or whatever that might look like. So I encourage everybody to you know, never stop learning, one, and as veterans, leverage the skill set you have against the challenges that other people have. Don't come in and say, I've got a hammer. What nails do you need whacked today? <laughs> you know, ask them, what are you trying to, are, are you trying to build a house? Well, it's funny you mentioned that it happened to have a hammer, right? right. Be, the, be the solution, but don't be the solution before you, before you figure out what the challenge is that you're there to solve. And you'll really go far in life in, in all aspects. That is so good. So good. What, what advice would you give to veterans out there? Um, cause I have a theory about guys in service and, and guys and gals in service. And a lot of us will find our way, you know, as we've exited the military, some people have a very, a very focused uh, exit. I mean, you're, you're certainly one of those people, you knew exactly what you wanted to do. You knew where you're going. Uh, some people know like, Hey, I just want to go to school. Or, hey, I just want to go mm-hmm. get a job in this city because this is where I'm from or, or, or my wife or her, her family lives here, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. But, you know, one year, two years later, three years later, kind of find yourself in the spot where you feel like you're floundering or you're, you're frustrated by your, by your circumstances that you feel like you're not really making the impact or the difference that you once did. What, what advice would you give to, to that group? And so we're, we're jumping into personal development here. So this is, am I going in a direction that some of your listeners think is a little crazy, a little woo-woo, but this is just work for me. So take that for what it's worth. <laughs> um, I had to take a hard look at what my purpose was. And you think of purpose in, in the, the holistic sense, you know, why am I here on earth? And for some people, for some veterans, that purpose has always been and will always be about service. And it might have been service to your country at one point. Now it's service to your community or service to your family or service to your employer. And those are all great methods of service. None of them is higher than the others. Depends on what your value system is. But if we don't take the time as veterans to sit down at some point and ask what our service is, because the military defined it for you for a period of your life. You know, here's your mission. Go do it. That's your that's your method of service. You don't have to think about it very much. Take right. the hill. Okay, great. I'm going to take the hill. Now you're your own commander. You're your own, you know, uh, a general. You're your own commander in chief of your life. We have to figure out what are the things that I'm here on earth to do. And there's a lot of different uh, organizations to do that. Some are faith based, some are spiritual based, some are based on gender. You know, there's men's groups, there's women's groups. Uh, go find those in your community, the ones that align with you and your and your belief system and your value system. Uh, get it, get involved, get into those. Any any place that is really you know, trying to show the way or help you find a way. It's not based on their way. It's kind of helping you discover what yours is. Uh, those are the places that I would go if I was a veteran in, in those uh, positions in that situation where I'm a year or two out. Life hasn't really taken off for me yet, trying to figure out if this is really where I need to be. And I'm feeling uh, lost because I don't have someone, you know, kind of pointing my own value system in my direction for me anymore. I've got to do it myself now. And ask yourself um, at the end of your life, and this is just more, you know, my own personal value system and sure. my life experience. Um, there's there's a, another, you know, great motivational saying because I study professional speakers, so I get to hear a lot of these. Uh, the saying is, one day you'll have the opportunity to meet who you would have become or who you could have become had you really excelled in your life and taken all of the opportunities and advantages that were made available to you. Make sure that when that day comes, that it's you looking in the mirror. And so that, that was a very impactful statement to me because I fully believe it, whether you have a belief in the afterlife or not. Um, I know one day, spiritually, I'm going to run into the version of myself that I could have become. And I want to make sure that when I do meet that person <laughs> in this life or the next, that uh, I can say, you know, I've, I've done everything I could to maximize this little slice of time that I've been given on earth as a father as a community member, as a leader, as a business owner, as an employee? Um, have I really done everything in the course of any given day that I could have done to make sure that I maximize this you know, piece of valuable space that I've been given in the universe? If the answer is yes, then I got nothing to fear about what comes in this life or what comes after. If the answer is no, and I'm not you know, really disciplining myself and taking advantage of all the opportunities available and being present as a father and as a husband and a community member or a church member, all the things that I value, 
Well, now I have an opportunity to start making up for that. Now I have an opportunity to step more fully into my purpose and my mission and why I'm here on earth. And again, if you're stepping forward, then you got nothing to fear in this life or the next. That's just my personal belief system. Sure. Uh, the resources, this is funny for entrepreneurs, they're always provided to us at the exact time that we need them. <laughs> and if you have to shut down a business and open up another one, and I've shut down plenty of business projects and had to try other things, like I said, through a lot of stuff against the wall, as long as I was moving forward and I wasn't dwelling in, in failure and in the past, the resources I needed were provided to me, either through you know, GI Bill benefits, through governmental programs, through my community, through that client that drops out of nowhere that I lost contact with years ago, but now suddenly needs what I have to offer. Or that employer that, you know, I was trying to get in their company for years and suddenly they have a, a, the exact right position in the right geography. Really weird. This stuff works out if you're leaning forward. And that's something that all veterans are taught to do in the military. Every day we're leaning forward. If you start to lean backward, there's an NCO there to correct you, to push you forward again. <laughs> that's, that's the NCO's job. So we all have that ability. Um, we need to just begin to provide that service for ourselves. Because there's no staff NCO behind me today. Maybe my wife. She definitely considers herself <laughs> staff NCO in my household or an officer for that matter. Uh, but, you know, lean forward on your own into whatever life it is that you want to build. Fantastic advice. And I uh, hope those that are listening that, you know, that may be struggling, defining their purpose. I mean, there's, there's plenty of resources. There, there is community. There are options for you. And, um, you know, I hope they take some, you know, some of your bits of advice to heart. Uh, you you, we've we've brushed now, I think, a number of times on the topic, and I I, I think we should finally just go there. Uh, we talk about mental health, and mm-hmm. so how have you seen that play out in the in, in the civilian space? And and feel free to take this and run with us any direction that you would like to go with it, because uh, I don't even really know if I can ask the question or really articulate what I'm trying to say. But how do you? stay in, you know, in that positive frame of mind, you know, after, you know, you get punched several times, like you've, you've mentioned, um, you know, some of the things that you saw, you know, when you're overseas and, and the things that you had to write on, uh, you know, the experiences of, of, um, other Marine units. And then you've talked about some of your business challenges and things that didn't work for you. And, yet you figured out a way to keep going forward. So like, talk us through, like, what does that mental, that mental health aspect of things look like? What would you say has been important to you in terms of helping you get through and, and how have you been able to bounce back? I mean, even recently through any, you know, through any business deals or situations that haven't gone the way you wanted them to go, you still figured out a way to keep going. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with the psychology piece of it. And then if you want me to move deeper in any area, we can go from there. Uh, as I mentioned, one of my core beliefs is that I may not always be able to control what's happening around me, but my uh, reaction to it is completely within my control. How I react often determines the outcome of that situation. How I react often determines, can I find the silver lining in this particular incident? Um, and so you know, if I'm in a car accident, was I able to get out of there with my life? Car accident sucks, but what's the good piece, you know, in, in, in this story? So I'm always looking for that. I'm always trying to, you know, you can call it, you know, a Pollyanna syndrome or whatever you want, but always trying to spin any given situation into, you know, the maximum benefit this might have for me. Even if I don't see the long-term impact, what can I look at today that's a good thing? So I lose a client. Well, do I still have money to keep the lights on for the rest of the month? Sure do. That's the positive. So I'm constantly looking for that. Now, that actually isn't something that I invented. It's something that uh, researchers have been studying for a long time. Uh, the, the field of psychology, if you look back to its earliest inception, you know, how the human brain works, okay? Um, it was originally developed to try to figure out how do we take people that are dysfunctioning, however you define that, and get them back up to a functional level of society, you know, help create uh, productive members of communities again. And that worked up to a time, but then people began to look at, well, there, there are some of us that are going through all the incidents that you might consider cause dysfunction. They were put into concentration camps. They were raised in abusive households. They were, uh, you know, downtrodden because of their gender or sexual orientation or whatever. Uh, they were put into jail for 30 or 40 years of their life, and yet they come out and still create positive change in the world. By all of our data, these people should be massively depressed. They should be addicted to drugs. They should be alcoholics. They should be homeless. And yet they aren't. And granted, this is, a, you know, n- not, not a large subset of society. These people that go through these experiences and come out even better on the tail end, they're rare. 
so psychologists began to study these people and figure out, you know, how do we model whatever the psychology is that these high performers have that still go through these crappy situations? They weren't born with a silver spoon. They didn't go through, you know, all of the blessings of a, of a you know, a Ivy League education, and they didn't come from good families, but yet they're creating empires. How do they do that? And so the field of positive psychology was born around that time, where people like Maslow, like um, uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, which don't ask me to spell his name, but he wrote the <laughs> book on flow. And he, he was asking himself, all right, you know, what are the, the attributes of high performers? How do they go through these bad situations and still come out ahead? And so when I began to research that area, there's an incredible amount of really well-written books on how do you take a bad situation and grow from it. Um, one of the books that's on my shelf right now I'm looking at is called What Doesn't Kill Us. And of course, that comes from the phrase, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And it's written by uh, a doctor named Joseph, uh, J-O-S-E-P-H. Um, and it's a, just a great primer on positive psychology, on the idea that there isn't just such a thing as post-traumatic disorder or post-traumatic stress. There's also a field called post-traumatic growth, mm. where they were looking at people like uh, people that survived concentration camps and yet still went on to make a positive difference in the world. Well, they had the ability to take a really bad situation, whether that was seeing something in combat and plenty of veterans fall into this camp as well, seeing something that was really, really nasty, like by all accounts, this should put you in therapy for the rest of your life. And yet these folks figured out a way to perceive it, that it, they, were, they were able to draw strength from it. It's not that they ignored it, not that they tried to forget about it. They fully integrated it as part of their past experience in their life, but then they made the conscious decision, where do I go from here? I can't change the past. But if I can figure out how to leverage it to make myself stronger or to make me more resilient or to help me do something positive in the world so that others don't have to go through that, I'm kind of called as a human being to make that happen as part of my life purpose. That, that's where they came from the perspective of, and I share that with them. And so from the field of mental health, if you find yourself not fully optimized mentally in that you're struggling with depression, post-traumatic uh, conditions of any kind. And Lord knows we all have plenty of those if we went through any experience in the military boot camp for many of us is traumatic enough, let alone combat. Find resources in your community. Uh, the VA now really doesn't stigmatize mental health at all. I've been seeing one of their therapists, I think, for almost a decade now. I uh, love it. Absolutely love it. And there's no shame in that now. If it helps me become a more present family member, a better business owner, a better member of my community, I'll take all the therapy and mental health I can get. And I encourage any veteran to do the same. Don't put the stigma on it. Um, you have these resources available to you. Many of them are free from the, the Department of Veterans Affairs, from your home community. Uh, many uh, spiritual organizations and churches offer these counseling services as well. Take advantage of them. Um, really, if, if, you're, if you're in a bad place mentally, I hate to say this to another veteran, but I can because you're a veteran. You got nobody to blame but yourself. Get online, research, find counselors, find therapists. If you can't pay for it yourself, you know, uh, find the people that are providing it as a, as a service back to their community for veterans. Get the help you need because you have so much to contribute to society because of the service you've done, because of the lessons you've had to learn. If you're not really optimizing yourself mentally and spiritually and emotionally and physically, you're holding yourself back from what you could be giving back to the world, how you could still be providing service to your community, your family, your business, your organization. So go find the help. No stigma around it at all. Go get what you need to be a better human being, however you define that for yourself. That's great. And I think it's phenomenal how, and you mentioned just a, just a moment ago, of how the stigma of mental health and, and seeking counseling is, I really do see that that's really been going away. And not that, I mean, it should have never even been there uh, in the first place, but for whatever reason, a lot of us, a lot of us tend to look at that as weakness. And I, and my response to that is like, well, if you got a broken leg or are you just going to walk around with a broken leg forever? Or are you going to go get it taken care of? And, uh, right. and it's important. I mean, we, there's, there, there are things that happened that, that happen, you know, in, in the mind that need, that need help also. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with, and it's like, you owe it to yourself to go get some help and go see somebody who actually knows what they're doing. And, uh, it'll make you, it'll help you become the better version of yourself. And, uh, and so I, I, one, I think it's phenomenal that, you know, one, you're being so open about your own experiences, but two, just how raw and real that is, uh, and how you've shared how it is very important that we as veterans, if we need the help or if we're struggling, you're absolutely right. Like 
nobody can read your mind. So like go out mm-hmm. and get the help that you need. I mean, bottom line, go, go get the help and just pick up the phone, call a buddy, call, you know, any number of these nonprofit organizations and see what, see what resources they have. So no, I, I think that's phenomenal. You wrote a book a few years ago, Pivot Point. Uh, would, would you mm-hmm. care to, would you care to share with us a little bit about that book? Sure. Sure. I was, uh, one trying to check that off my bucket list. So check mark done. <laughs> that was one of the things I wanted to do with my life was produce at least one book. I'm in the middle of my second one, so expect that out later this year. Uh, but the the book itself, I was writing for a business audience. And so if there's anybody out there of the mindset that you'd like to produce a book, there are two reasons to do that. Uh, one is you have some kind of revenue model behind it, either in the book or in the services that the book is talking about. Or two, you just want to do it just to get your story out. And both of them are very valid reasons to write a book. Uh, you don't need a publisher to do that these days. Mine has been self-published, sold thousands of copies. I have made a good deal of money off of it because I didn't have to worry about Wiley or Random House taking you know, 90% of the book's value away from me. So I make all the profit from the book, which is cool. Uh, but because mine was written not just to tell a story, mine was written to generate business on the tail end. Um, all a book can do, if you have any listeners uh, on this podcast that are you know, in business trying to figure out how do I write a book to leverage that, a book is really just a thick business card. And so, yes, provide value in it. Yes, you know, uh, lay out all of the methodology and resources and everything that you can think of to put into a book. Don't hold it back by any means, but understand that the book's purpose in and of itself doesn't hold a lot of value if it's sitting on someone's shelf. If it's a fictional book, if you just want to write that great story that you've held in your heart and you want to be the next Hemingway, yeah, good, but get the book in as many hands as, of people as you possibly can. And that might mean you buying copies and just handing them out. And that's cool, too. Sure. If it's a business related book, you're trying to generate leads back in your own business or generate consulting clients or whatever that looks like. Um, give enough in the book to help people understand that there's just a surface, you know, just the tip of the iceberg is all I could write about in 180 pages because you have that depth of knowledge for whatever it is that you do. Encourage them to reach out to you to get more. And that might look like hiring you as a speaker or a consultant or writing some, you know, uh, specialized industry publication for them. Maybe you wrote it for a realtor and now you want to write it for accountants. You know, and an accountant picks it up and says, hey, this is great, but we really need it in our industry. Great. Now you've got another way to produce that value to add back to the world. Um, so writing a book's a lot of fun. Uh, some people are listening to this probably thinking, good Lord, that'd be the like I could think pulling my own teeth out with a pair of pliers would be more pleasant <laughs> than writing a book. And that's OK. Maybe that's not for you. Uh, but for, for what I do, it's a great way to kind of get the word out and also to provide value back to the people who I want to serve. Talk with us a little bit about the content of the book. What's the message of the book? Uh, the title of the book is Pivot Point, and the subtitle is Turn on a Dime Without Sacrificing Results. And so it was actually uh, written as a fictionalized story of a patrol that I went on during my second tour in Iraq. I was actually attached underneath uh, then General Mattis, later on to become the Secretary of Defense, uh, James Mattis. And it was a story that they never let me publish while I was in the Marine Corps, because the time it came out and what was going on around Fallujah at the time, they didn't want that publicized. And so what I did was wrapped a business parable inside of that book and that story so that uh, people could follow along, whether they were veterans or whether they were running businesses themselves, to figure out how do we adapt to change on the fly, which the military is really good at, and what we had to do during that patrol into Fallujah. Um, Just, you know, a, a brief overview of it. There were about 30 vehicles that were sent into the heart of Fallujah with no other air support, no snipers, no artillery, nothing else inside the city to help us in order to negotiate a ceasefire. And General Mattis was leading the charge because he was expecting that he would be captured. He was expecting to be captured and and held hostage, which would give our military forces permission to lay waste to the city to get him back, which is really all they wanted to do in 2004 anyway. So he put himself on the line to do that, which is a very General Mattis kind of thing to do. They never let me write about it. They never let me write about it because they didn't want the you know American public or our enemies to know that a general was willing to do that. And so, you know, I waited it about 10 years until after the fact, and then I was able to publish the book and release it. Um, but then wrapping that into, if you're a business owner, how do we take the lessons that the military learns every single day on the fly to make ourselves better so that if a unit in Afghanistan makes a mistake, my unit in Iraq doesn't have to suffer the same mistake next week. We all learn from each other at an incredibly rapid pace as part of our lessons learned system. How do we begin to apply that into a business context to make our organizations continuously better? So that's really the crux of the book. Oh, that's that, that's fantastic. Well, Sean, thanks. I mean, thanks for so much for taking time out of your day. But uh, it, 
final words. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give this last segment to you, like what, you know, what parting comments, thoughts, uh, words of wisdom and words, <laughs> words of advice that you may have. Sure. Yeah. The, um, the way to get in touch with me, best way is to cruise by my website, which is Shoshin consulting.com. That's S H O S H I N consulting.com. You can see a little bit about what I'm doing with my post-military life there. And then parting words to all of our veterans who are going through transition or are coming out on the other side of transition is that you have been built by the military to essentially have a Porsche engine inside you, psychologically, physically, emotionally, mentally. You have a Porsche engine. The highest performing type of human that exists in the world is a veteran because we're put into situations where we perform or die. So if you've lived this long, you've made it through boot camp, you made it through your tours, in, in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever you went, you are a high-performing human being. Congratulations. The challenge you're going to have, and if you haven't noticed this already, you soon will, is that you're going to be dropped into environments where everybody else is taught to operate at about the level of a Model T Ford, just getting by. Like They'll, they'll get you from A to B. It's not going to be very fast or efficient, but they'll get you there where you've been trained to you know, crank up you know, all eight cylinders of your engine, inject a whole bunch of nitrous oxide into there, and get somewhere fast because life was on the line. And if you didn't do it, people weren't going to come home. So the challenge we have is learning how to operate with a Porsche level engine inside of us around a world that's only trained to expect Model T results. And what that might mean for you, at least initially, is cranking back the number of cylinders you have engaged. Keep them there for when they're needed. Don't, you know, don't let them go to rust. You know, find other ways in your life to continue to operate as a high performer. But realize that you have to crank it down to the level of the people around you until you can find ways to bring them up a cylinder or two, if you you know follow this engine analogy I'm using, uh, so that you can make everybody around you better. And I learned this from bitter experience. You drop yourself into an organization, try to operate at a model, uh, or is try to operate as as a Porsche engine immediately, or as a Ferrari engine immediately. Bad things happen because people see that and they're scared, they're fearful that you'll take their jobs, they think that you're arrogant, that you don't know what you're doing, even if you do succeed. So. Learn from Sean's experience here. <laughs> Dial it back a bit until you can figure out a way to bring everybody else up with you. And when they see that you are making everyone better, that's when your team will allow you to begin to engage your full level of function. It's when your supervisors will begin to see you belong in a supervisory position, in a managerial position, that NCO or officer position, if you will, inside an organization. Or like me, you'll realize that in the field that you're in, no one's ever going to operate at higher than a, a, a Model T Ford level, but I can be a Porsche out there on my own. Um, and so that's the best piece of advice I could give to a transitioning veteran. Understand the environment you're being dropped into, just like you had to brief into the military. Understand the, the limitations of that environment and how to succeed once you're there. And, and honestly, I think that's a great reminder for those that have been out you know, for, for some time and they in there and they are. Yeah, maybe they maybe they haven't been firing on all, on all cylinders for a long time, and maybe it's time to waken some of those cylinders back up, or maybe they find themselves consistently frustrated because they keep burning relationships because they've been operating on on all eight cylinders for the last five ten years. And so, I mean, I think it's a mm-hmm. great way to to it, it. It's a great illustration and a great great thing to reflect on as you go about your own business dealings, whether you own your own business or you're a VP or, or director somebody in, in in some form of management i mean it really it really doesn't matter so thanks for sharing that my pleasure sir thanks yeah. for having me on such concise insight and what a wild journey has been on i'd encourage you to even go back and re-listen to segments of this podcast because there were several themes here from mental health to business practices to understanding how to add value there was so much here and i was grateful he'd share his experiences I'd also encourage you to check out his book, Pivot Point, available on Amazon. Thank you once again for tuning in. I'm excited to announce that we are beginning to close in on the finish line of season one and finalizing the lineup for season two. As a concept crystallizes for season two, I'll be incredibly excited to share with you the direction we're headed. Bottom line, it's going to be awesome. But I want to give you a heads up now. I'll go ahead and let you know that it will include a video version of the podcast, so I'm super excited about that. Also, I would love to connect with you. I devoted a substantial amount of my time on LinkedIn, but I would really love to connect with you not only there, but on other platforms. Please, please, please reach out to me and connect with me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 
message me. I actually do write back. I do pay attention. I just absolutely love the community we're building through this, and I can't wait to connect with you. Stay safe through the COVID-19 madness. It will be over before you know it. And thanks again for tuning in. Tell your friends about the show on social media and be sure to follow or subscribe so you don't miss a thing. 